Hey everybody, Norm from Tested here. One of the emerging technologies that we haven't used a lot of yet is augmented reality. We could use a lot of VR, but not a lot of AR. So I'm seeking every opportunity to try out AR gear. And I'm actually on my way to meet Dave Lavery, who works at NASA. And he's been in collaboration with Microsoft to use their HoloLens technology. Well, not for entertainment, not for communication, but for visualization. It's a cool demo that I can't wait to check out. So let's come on. Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and today I'm joined by Dave Lavery from NASA headquarters. You're out here on the West Coast, and you have some interesting technology with you guys. Now NASA, you guys have always been tapping into new and interesting technologies, but uh, this is HoloLens. Um, you guys have been working with Microsoft to develop a piece of software that uh, isn't just illustrative of how, how a HoloLens can be used, but something that is used at NASA. So can you tell me about that relationship and what this demo is? So what we've got is a software application that runs on the HoloLens device called OnSite. And OnSite is intended to be used by the scientists and the engineering teams that are actually operating the rover's curiosity and opportunity on the surface of Mars right now. And the reason that we developed it is we want to basically build an entirely new way for the rover science team and the rover operations team to interact with the rover and to understand the Mars environment that they're actually um, working at the moment. One of the biggest problems that we've had is that we have science team members, for example, who've been looking at photographs from the surface of Mars for the past 20 years. And they, when they look at them, you basically get every day a set of flat displays mm -hmm. that you look at on a, on a computer monitor, and here's one image, and here's a couple of others. And, and maybe they've been mosaic and stick, stitched together to make uh, a nice panorama or slice of a panorama. But when you look at that on a flat 2D panel, you really don't understand exactly what the layout of the objects are on the surface or what the environment really is like geographically. And what we found is that when we show them, for example, a nice big panorama and all this wonderful, glorious detail and everything else, the reality is the scientist's ability to take that panorama, even after 20 years of practice, and sort of mentally wrap it around their head in their brain and understand that this rock actually is not in front of me, it's actually over to this side of me. And this rock, although it appears almost the same size as this one in the panorama, actually this one's very, very large and that one's very, very small, but it's warped because of the distortion of the pan. And just mentally undoing all that is really, really hard even with a lot of practice. Right, you're talking about using augmented reality technology, which can be used for entertainment or even communications, but you're using it as visualization. Exactly. And it's, you know, you can think about visualizations in terms of a computer model. You can model curiosity, you can model Mars, and look at it from a distance and move at it, you know, around with uh, your traditional uh, mouse and keyboard, but this is one-to-one -one scale. Which is important. This is basically a completely different way of imagining the environment versus what we've been used to. This is basically taking the scientists and rather than showing them images and saying, try to imagine what Mars is like. Instead, we're putting them on the surface of Mars and letting them literally explore the surface as if they were actually there. They are not confined to just the one vantage point of where the rover imagery came from, but rather you have a completely modeled environment so they can get up, they can walk around, if there's a rock that's of interest, they can walk over to it. They can understand where that rock is in relation to everything else as if they were actually there themselves walking around the surface. And that, that's fun to be able to see you know, the Mars surface from the Curiosity perspective. But tell me, how does an operations engineer use that in day-to-day -day work? Well, it, number one, you're right. It, it is fun. It's, but, but in addition to that, it does a couple of things almost instantly. First off, it just innately gives you a much better, much clearer understanding of what the surface of Mars is like as a place mm. and that region where you're exploring. In particular, for example, with the, with the science team, many of the geologists, when they actually go out and they explore a region on Earth, they, they look around, they understand the context, they can look at a slope and understand the flow lines and how that might affect um, when the rocks were formed, they'll, they'll look for how the flow lines might have channeled the water and then the, the resulting rock should have uh, flow directions and cross bedding that map to the, the way that terrain was imagined. And you can get that by sort of looking at rocks from different angles and exploring and looking to see where the slope lines are. That's very hard to do when you look at flat images. Yeah. But when you look at an immersive environment, I can do the same thing. I can walk around just like I would out in the field and get the same sort of understanding just by looking at the topology and the geomorphology of the entire region. That instantly brings a much better understanding.
<laughs> but then in addition to that, the other thing that happens when the engineers look at it, mm -hmm. they get a much better feel for, you know, I may be able to look at certain numbers and sort of get an idea of, of how bad a slope is, but now I can actually look at a slope and say, okay, that's something I know the rover can handle, or that's something that, that it can't, or more frequently, that's one that's eh, right on the edge. Let's take a much closer look before you commit to driving up or down that slope. And then combine that with the numbers to make exactly. the decisions, to actually send the commands. Right. Now, and the neatest part about it is your ability to gather and understand the environment mm. that way is much faster than looking at flat displays and numbers and then trying to create the model of that environment in your head. It's built into our lizard brains. Exactly. We have tens of thousands of years of evolution which have yep. trained our bodies to work by being immersed in an environment. Now the degree of immersion, because you know the Curiosity rover that's capturing these images has a stereo camera, but you're not doing just 360 panoramas. This is actually a modeled environment? This is actually a modeled environment. So the rover ha on the, the mass of the rover, that what's called the mass cam, is actually a stereo pair of cameras. And we actually capture with the stereo imagery enough information to create a three-dimensional model of the surface of Mars. So yeah, you're not just seeing a flat panel, uh, a flattened a mosaic wrapped around you, but you're actually seeing a three-dimensional model with the real imagery draped over it and mapped onto it properly and, and properly correlated. So I can actually find, for example, a rock or a boulder that's in the scene, walk up to it and then walk around it, see it from different angles and understand it as a three-dimensional object. Is that modeling done computationally like with photogrammetry or does an artist go in it and is refine? As much as possible right now and we're sort of 98% of the way there right now mm. and by the time we have the full operational release of this later in the summer, we'll be at the 100% process where it's all an automated pipeline process. We know from um, data about the camera set itself, exactly what the offset between the two lenses is, and from that we can mm -hmm. basically just back solve to create all the three-dimensional data that we need. And it's most important, that, that surrounding area around the rover is what you care most about, and right. that's where you're going to the highest resolution exactly. imagery, so it all works out. Yeah. So how much of Mars have you actually modeled in that? So at the very, very high resolution, including the, the full 3D terrain maps, that allow us to actually go in and explore at that level of detail. We basically have the entire traverse that Curiosity has taken ever since she landed uh, almost three years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, which is about a 12 kilometer traverse. So I actually could walk along that path that Curiosity had followed at that resolution or something very close to it all the way back to the start of the mission. Now beyond that, we actually have the entire planet mapped, but at a lower resolution using orbital imagery. But again, there in most cases for larger structures, we actually have 3D information as well. As the orbiters go around, effectively we can use it as a synthetic aperture radar system to create a 3D map of the entire planet as well. So if I'm looking at landscapes in the distance, in this experience, that topology is actually modeled. Exactly. It's not just wallpaper right. in the distance. Exactly. And you could actually go to that point on the distant horizon, pop yourself over to that location and stand on a mountaintop and literally look around yourself as if you're standing on a mountaintop. This is augmented reality, which means you it is modeling on top of the real world, so you can navigate, you can walk, use it in rooms like this. Right. At NASA, are there dedicated rooms where people put on the HoloLens? And Actually, one of the big things that we tried to do with this was take advantage of the fact that you're still around the periphery, can see your real environment, okay. and that allows you to use this in almost any room that you want to. You don't require a special room. You don't require fiducial structures up in the corners mm -hmm. to do tracking or anything else like this. I can pop this on in any room, in any office building or any campus or anywhere else and do my work and what I need to do without having to require a whole lot of additional infrastructure. That was really the attraction of this solution um, that we, we really were trying to work for. We've done a lot of other systems uh, using several different other hardware and software products and um, what we found is although technically in terms of presenting the information, they may work just as well. In a lot of cases, the fact that they required special structures or additional cameras for doing the tracking of your head that were offboard, things like that, really sort of limited us because you did, you had to have a special facility. Mm. This allows me to basically say, I can do this anywhere as a self-contained system. And that was what was really attractive to us as a solution that would our scientists and our researchers could use in their own offices, back at their universities, or things like that. Is the idea going forward that you're going to build more applications like this so that every engineer, every scientist, every researcher can have a system like this that they can use to visualize and, and, be, and experience you know, the, the commands that they're sending in a tangible way? 
Absolutely. I mean, the first thing that we're doing is we're actually using this now in, 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 in an operational setting with the Curiosity rover. And we're baselining this capability in as the standard way that we'll be interacting with the, the 2020 rover that we'll be sending, uh, launching in a couple of years as the basically twin sister of Curiosity. So in terms of surface operations on Mars, this will become the standard. But beyond that, we're also looking at the same capability for doing things like designing the next generation of spacecraft. Mm. We're working on a, a lander for Europa right now, and the way we're actually building the design for the, the spacecraft itself is through the use of traditional CAD modeling, but then it gets visualized with this sort of a tool where I can then collaborate with all my other designers. We can pop the spacecraft virtually right in front of us. We can all gather around and look at it from different angles, spin it, torque it around, point to different objects collaboratively, which is a very effective way of, of working together on a common design. And are there any plans to release this data to the public, these experiences? In, in the case of on-site, in the Mars visualization in particular, um, what we are planning on doing is making a public version available that allows you to visualize Mars in the same way the science team does, just mm -hmm. as fast as the science team does. Mm -hmm. The one thing we'll remove is the ability to actually command the rover. That piece we'll, we're going to take out, we're going to reserve that part just for us. Um, but in terms of, of being able to understand Mars as a place and see it the same way the science team does, that's going to be available to the general public across the board. I think that's going to be important because like all VR and AR technologies, it really is something that you have to experience and understand yep. how it's being used. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dave, for chatting Glad with to me. do it. Yeah, and thank you for giving us a demo. Yep. So I thought that was a really interesting demo, and what struck me most about that on-site Mars experience that they were using, it's actually more akin to virtual reality than augmented reality. When you think of augmented reality, you think of a technology that puts objects into the real world, like a, a small figurine or a character walking through a wall or a figurine on your table, your real world table. What this on-site demo really felt like was very akin to the VR experiences I've tried out. I tried to put you in a location. In this example, uh, Mars, them modeling the geometry of Mars and using the photographic data taken by the Curiosity rover to map that area. Um, in that sense, it wasn't groundbreaking to me, but what was groundbreaking was how comfortable it was to use it. Now, a lot of people have been talking about HoloLens and the limitations of the HoloLens technology, the field of view, for example. You can see as I was using the demo, I could only see the Mars world in about a rectangle this big in front of my, my vision. It didn't encompass my entire field of view. And to be fair, that image was completely opaque. I couldn't see objects behind it. But my attention was focused there. So I was looking at the landscape, looking at the rover directly in my center of my field of view, but also walking around my real world environment really comfortably. Something that I haven't yet been able to do with a fully enclosed tethered VR headset. Um, with the HoloLens using that on-site demo, I could walk around and navigate around couches, around poles, because in my periphery, my brain was still processing the real world around me even though I was focused on this other environment that it was putting me in. Um, it was a really interesting experience. I love that they're not just doing 360 panoramas, that they're actually modeling Mars. I was able to use a gesture and navigate far into the distance. Now, the resolution of the terrain far off in distance wasn't as high fidelity, but it was so cool to be able to walk around. Um, and I really like what Dave said about their their plan to put this on the desks of as many researchers as possible in the future and, and let scientists and engineers and researchers use this type of technology to add visualizations complementary to your traditional flat screen experiences. I think that's really neat. So that was just another example of how this type of technology is being implemented, not just for entertainment purposes, uh, but for actual practical applications. And I can't wait to see more of these demos and experiences. So that was really cool. I really enjoyed it. And thank you to NASA and Dave Lavery for giving me that demo. You'll find more of our videos of our demos and experiences on Tested. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until then, we'll see you next time.